So welcome to Northern Powerhouses, our business success stories series of interviews where we discuss with local business leaders, their backgrounds, their successes and their challenges and what's really driving them forwards. And this afternoon, I'm delighted that we have with us Helen Curtis, who's the founder at Coterie Marketing. So Helen, thank you for spending a bit of time with us. And if you'd like to introduce yourself and Coterie Marketing, what you do and how you help people, that would be wonderful. Wonderful. Thanks, Chris, for inviting me to come and have a chat. So, yeah, Helen Curtis, um, MD of uh, Coterie Marketing, and um, and also we have something called Coterie Community as well. So, actually, I'm running that now. My business partner, Joe, runs Coterie Marketing. Um, Coterie Marketing has been going for 10 years um, this year, and we, we're quite niche in what we do. So, we basically help... Uh, we do something called partner marketing where it's where two brands come together. So if you think like cost of coffee at the moment, I've got Marks and Spencer sandwiches in there. That's yeah. partner marketing, ingredient marketing. But we do it in the tech industry. So Intel inside on your laptop yep. or it could be like a big systems integrator with Microsoft or something like that. And um, so, yes, yeah, so we've been doing that for 10 years. We've worked with about 60 well, it's probably more than 60 global brands. So people like Cisco, BT, Verizon. Um, for a for a small business, we kind of, yeah. we're punching high. We're working with some of the biggest global tech brands in the world, Tata Communications. Um, and then Coterie Community is something that we set up a year ago. Yep. So that is a special, it's a not-for-profit, and we did it with the University of Huddersfield. Yep. We were a knowledge transfer partnership. And it's basically to a community for partner marketeers. So this group of marketeers we work with tend to be not recognized by um, other marketing areas. Right. So we basically set up the this community and we've also set up training and standards. And we've actually just had our training course recognized by the Child Institute of Marketing. So oh, wow. that's that space that we're in. We've kind of got two arms to it. Um yeah, that's us. Well, that's that's fascinating part of marketing. I mean, like, I, marketing is such a broad word, isn't it? And it's like, it's, always, yeah. it's so, 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 I mean, just thinking about uh, businesses that may, may not be watching this, it, it, if they know they, they could do more, but by, by partnering up with people, you're, you're the guys that can help them find the right partnerships, or is it, is it two people coming to you to help, help them integrate each other, or is it a bit of both? Yes. Yeah, we won't go and find the partner. So it's basically pulling the partnerships together yep. and saying, how do you tell the joint story? So nice. it's like, you know, you could go to the shop and you could buy some, as is a terrible analogy, but I always use it, some eggs, some flour, some sugar, some margarine. You could get all the ingredients yourself. You could then get a recipe book and, and make a cake yourself. Yep. Or you could buy a cake. So yep. we work with the people who go, right, you want to create a cake? And then we go, well, what kind of cake is it? Is it a birthday cake? Is it an organic cake? Is it gluten-free? Is it, you know, is it a low-cost cake? Like, what is it? Yep. And who's your target audience? So we think about the target audience. We think about the ingredients. Because a lot of partner marketing is, well, we'll just stick our logo on it. We'll put our logos on it. We do yes. this, they do that. We do this. We, we And the end customers go in, yes. I don't care. I like, I want a solution to a problem. Yeah. So we'll help them with the messaging and then we'll help them do the go-to-market plan. So, right, you know what your message is. How do you now go and communicate that out? And then we will help them do what we all sorts of other stuff around, like digital. A lot of partner marketing is very poorly kind of displayed in a digital context. So you like the web, both websites are not connected. The messaging is yes. not connected. You can't find it. Yep. Um, so what I would encourage anybody listening is – that you can do a lot of this yourself is is say you're a business, you're a restaurant or something like that. And you might be working with somebody who supplies your particular ingredient that's quite like a premium ingredient. You might display and sell some of their products. You might ask them for a bit of marketing support. So it's kind of totally. using the ingredients yeah. that you've got, the ingredient brands. Um, and then we also help companies then do the channel marketing out. So say they want to kind of scale out with the partners that they work across um, how do you industrialize that? How do you do that on a bigger scale? And I'm doing quite a bit of work around that at the moment as well. So, yeah. Exciting, very fascinating. So, so perhaps if, if you could tell us a bit more about your background, how you got into business and why this particular one? Yeah, yeah. I know it's quite a niche and unusual business. So, yeah. 
my background, I'm a marketeer by trade. I went to the University of Huddersfield. And so it's quite early to be doing a dedicated marketing degree, to be honest, like in the early 90s. Yep. And I was very fortunate. I got a placement year with ICL, which was got which was which got bought by Fujitsu. Um, yep. And I got on their graduate scheme. So I kind of fell into the IT industry at a really good time when it was the whole yep. kind of tech boom, the dot-com yep. boom. Um, I worked at... Um, Fujitsu, then I went to Intel. Um, and at Intel, I was working with UK PC manufacturers, trying to get them to use Intel inside funding, yeah. which is basically marketing funds to help them promote yes. the Intel as an ingredient brand. And kind of was like, people can't figure out how to use this money. There's all this money sat there and they can't figure out how to use it. And I'm doing my best to help them, but there's a lot of rules and regulations. I then went to BT, uh, Global Services, and was doing proposition marketing out to the end corporate customers and I had all these ingredient technology brands and I was like I need to be doing this part of the marketing thing but I haven't got enough time to do it so after about 16 years in corporate I was like I need wouldn't it be good if there was somebody like me to help somebody like me (laughs) and that was kind of the idea behind it so I left and I I joined I set up a within another agency to start with for a couple of years because I had no idea how to run a business, which was an amazing experience. I'm really grateful for that. And then, but they were doing all kinds of things. And I was like, no, I really believe in my niche. And I believe, you know, you're better to be good at one thing rather than trying to do everything. So um, set up Coterie in 2013. Um, Really kind of quite lifestyle sort of ambition to start with. Yep. was like my kids were young just go out do good work for clients but the demand grew yep. and so I was like I need this you know need more people to work with me my business partner who I'd worked with previously Joe joined two years in and um and the the business really grew from there and we've what's been nice is even though we do more now we stay true to what differentiators and the and understanding the nuances of, of, of what we do. I, I mean, I always wanted to run my own business. I remember back in like when I was at university, I have this very distinct memory of saying I'd love to run my own business. Yep. Um, but um, obviously it took a few years <laughs> to get there. <laughs> yeah, it it does for most people. I, I only know, I think I've up to about nine people, and this is, this is over the last 20 years or so, I've met that have actually started a business never worked for anybody else uh, you know started a business straight from either school or university it's not really? very common at all and i've spoken yeah. to hundreds if not thousands of business people so uh, yeah I, I, it's the right way to it, it, it's the way most people go i i find so i mean going pre even pre-college is this is this what you always saw yourself saw yourself doing or did you have any other sort of plans mapped out for yourself no, I didn't see myself. <laughs> in fact, I don't think anybody sees themselves going into partner marketing. In fact, it's one of the things that I've actually written a blog on it going, nobody at school says, I want to be a partner marketer. I don't even think most marketeers go, I want to be a partner marketer. <laughs> most people are accidental partner marketeers. When I was at school, I wanted to be in the police for a really long time. Oh, um, really? But I obviously wasn't committed enough because I had when I was at university, there was like a police open evening or a night out, and I went on the night out. So I obviously wasn't like... <laughs> fully committed um I think that um so yeah so no I, I didn't I I did my A-levels I kind of with my A-levels I did what I was good at which was business studies computer studies and geography and then with my degree it was and my placement year brought in my A-level computer studies right. as well so I think it was like the tech bit I was I understood business and marketing but I actually understood tech which I think again was just it was all just good fortune really yeah um so no not really at all I think I've done marketing I went into sales and I've gone back to marketing and I'm glad I did that because I think that th- those skills have stood me in good stead as well um but I think I'm quite unusual to have done a marketing degree to be working in marketing to be consulting in marketing and I've even taught at the university um, some marketing as well. So it's quite unusual to actually still be using my degree. Yeah, yes. I th- yeah, I, th- I, I would totally agree. And and so, I mean, obviously you said you, you're just about to celebrate your 10, your 10 years, which as we, as we said before we started is puts you in the top 4% of the businesses, unfortunately, because only yeah. 4% of the businesses survive 10 years. But looking back over that time, what are some of the biggest issues you'd say and challenges do you say you've had to overcome? 
I think that, um, well, we chatted about this earlier. I, when I set out to run the business, I um, I didn't know how to run a business. I'd spent like 16 years in a corporate. And even though I would have thought I was commercially astute, I wasn't yeah. because there's an HR department, there's an accounts department, there's a yes. tax department, there's a legal department. Uh, you know, it's not your money. Yeah. Um, so you know the skills that you need to the learning curve is massive isn't it and I think like I was saying to you now I think I look now and I'm doing a lot of work with the University of Huddersfield and there's masses of resources available and I don't know if they were available 10 years ago and if they were I wasn't aware of them so I had to kind of like learn a lot of how, of how to run a business so I think that was a was a challenge and I think it's that somebody said my accountant said and I've, I've written it down so I can but it says turnover is vanity profit is sanity and cash is king yes. and it was like I hear a lot of people talk about turnover but it's actually profit and cash and you can be a re- you can be a busy fool <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I, I'm, I you know I much prefer to make you know a large profit on a small turnover than the other way around um, exactly. exactly. And I can say cash is key. If you're not collecting it, then it it was it yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh. Um I think the other thing as well is for me was overcoming imposter syndrome. So yep. I think, you know, I'd moved kind of roles and things, I'd stayed in the same industry, and then f- focusing in on one area was um a good thing because I thought, well, I'll grow in confidence because I, I can become like expert in doing this. And that's definitely worked. Having said that, you still have the imposter syndrome and running a business imposter syndrome and all of these. And I think, you know, you haven't got the cushion of a of a kind of big corporate around you. You're kind of it's it's down to you. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges. But I, I think running your own business is probably one of the best ways to overcome that. Yes. Because you go, well, there's nobody else done this other than me. So it's um so I think that's that's been a, a big thing as well. Yeah, uh, I, uh, probably uh, I would say at least forty percent of the people that I speak to doing these interviews would say that's one of the challenges. So you're in a, in a good, you're probably more than fifty to be fair. But really, good, good, good people. I heard somebody, I think some of my colleagues were saying uh, recently that they heard Stephen Bartlett, who's obviously one of the yes. most, most successful young entrepreneurs in the UK, and he said this, which I thought was really interesting. He said um, he loves the imposter syndrome. Because it, because it means he's in the right room, he's going to learn something. Yes, yeah, yeah. Which I really like a way of turning, a, uh, you know, what f- it feels like a negative into a positive. It's, it's yeah, I'm in the right place. If I'm not feeling a bit of an imposter, I'm probably not going to learn anything today. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, th- I, I, I quite like that idea. So, so thinking about, obviously, um, you've had to overcome these things. What are some of the things you've learned about growing a business, uh, you know, it, 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 over the last 10 years? I think, you know, it's interesting you say about Stephen Bartlett. I think one of the things that I've, um, that I've, sorry, my dog's like trying to get in on the act again. No problem, <laughs> like no problem with that at all. <laughs> um, I think it, it is continuous learning is massive for me. It just seems to have got, I did my master's in digital marketing during COVID um, because I thought I don't want to become an old-fashioned marketeer and not understand all this digital malarkey. Yep. Um, and that was a that was amazing. Not just learning about that, but learning a new way to think yep. as well was really good. Yes. Um, addicted to podcasts. So Stephen Bartlett, I listened to yep. all of his. Um, I'm always kind of like hungry for sort of learning and developing. I'm going on an AI marketing course in a couple of weeks. So I think for me, um, it's not it's that kind of continuous learning because you are your asset. And obviously even with your team, it's, it's developing in them. So that's a big thing. Brilliant. I think um, boundaries <laughs> is a good one. Yep. Um, so boundaries in terms of your time, yep. how you manage your time. I think there's been a couple of occasions where I've been in danger of completely like burning myself out. COVID was a, a classic. We had a boom during COVID because people weren't hiring. And so they needed marketing support we're a virtual business so we were geared up for it straight away yep. and um and I was just kind of like sat here constantly for like a year and yep. I think that um I think keeping that balance and watching your boundaries 
in, in on lots of levels, I think is really important. And then I think the third thing for me, which is probably more of an, a recent thing that I've tuned into, is trusting your gut instinct. Like there's certain situations and certain things that have happened where my gut instinct has been saying, um, this is not right, or this is right, or and I've yep. my mind has got in the way and I've like tried to go super logical and all of that. And then I've turned yep. around and go, oh, my gut instinct was right. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting one. I think I think it was Malcolm Gladwell wrote, wrote a book, and I can't remember the title about using gut instinct. You know, yeah. using it and maybe enhancing on it. But it but accepting that probably because gut instinct is really using the subconscious. You know, the but the, the subconscious process information so quickly. It's the one that's actually it, it is not just a feeling. It is something that's processed very quickly and without our conscious thought. And it's like. Hmm. Yeah. Let let let's follow it. And and the most important thing is because it's a good, it's a feeling. We're more likely to be engaged with whatever it's come up with, if that makes any sense. It's, it... I, I, absolutely, absolutely. And I think, <clears throat> and I think when you run your own business, there's a lot of people who have a lot of opinions yep. about what you're doing. And um, because you're ultimately responsible, like you want to listen uh, absolutely to other yes. opinions. So that doesn't mean that they're not valuable. But sometimes you can put more value on them than your own gut instinct because yep. you're thinking, oh, maybe they are the right as well. So, um, so yeah, so that's that's the other thing that I've learned. But let's say it's more of a recent thing. Brilliant, brilliant. And and we obviously you're, you're a little bit aware that we're a coaching organisation. I'm keen to know who the best coaches you've worked with or people that have influenced you most, whether that's business, sport, or just life in general. Yeah, do you know, I think it's um. I don't know if there is a saying, but something like, is it like you have a different coach for a different time in your life or something like that? Yes. Yeah. And I, I think that that's definitely been my experience. I've had different coaches. I didn't really have good coaching in the corporate world. And I, right. I mean, I had some very successful bosses, but but um, I think that I think I'm, I had a gap in that coaching space. But when I set up the business, I had a great coach. She was brilliant and she was, because I had this view of what does a business owner and MD need to look like and they were like, they've got to be super aggressive and they've got to work constantly and they've got to, you know, got to dress like this and be like this. And she was like, who says so? Like, and so she really challenged my thinking and was like, well, be the MD you want to be. Yep. And I was like, oh, that's a weird concept. <laughs> like, am I going to be like real? So I think, um, so she was brilliant and really gave me confidence in those early stages. And then there was a point where it's like, okay, who do I need next? And yep. then, so it's evolved. And I think also sometimes with coaching, you can get it by absorbing different information, like with Stephen Bartler, um, there's people like Mel Robbins, there's loads of different people who are very inspiring. I mean, I think we're very fortunate now to have access to so much different content as well as business owners. Yes, I completely agree they, they, all, all the information is out there I, I often say I think that where, where coaching comes in for me which is not necessarily the same for you but but the knowledge is out there and I often say to people I can give you a list of two two thousand £2, pounds worth of business books read it all do it all you can get to 100 million plus turnover that isn't it's the use of the knowledge that's the most important thing so it's finding yeah. the right mechanism with which to learn and to do uh, in the right proportions, I think is is really is really fascinating. But I think that's that a really really good point because I think you can sometimes get overwhelmed. I've yes. gone through phases where I've digested that much um, knowledge yep. that I can't see the wood for the trees, and I'm like, which bits are relevant for me? Yes. Um, so I, yeah, I do I do agree. I think it's being a bit. It's also being selective and how you implement it for you as well. It's difficult. It, you're absolutely right. It's it, it's so difficult for us to self to see the wood for the trees it's why you know i've got my own coach because i yeah. I, know, I know the stuff i've been doing it for 20 years but i can't do it for myself yeah it, yeah yeah we've still all got our blind blind spots i think you said right right at the start or maybe it was before we were talking that we don't you know you didn't know what you didn't know when you started yeah. and, and that's yeah. the challenge it's it's not knowing um yeah. and, and it's finding out so so you know committed to to lifelong learning is is a wonderful thing to do i think because there's always more knowledge i i, I heard a quote I, I was told many years ago and i thought it was really interesting that um sir tony uh tony ben uh who, the, the ex labor mp yeah. uh, became lord, lord ben when, when he retired from the house of parliament he he started to 
um, lecture at universities. He'd, he'd be a speaker at universities on a regular regular basis. And he'd always apparently he'd always start by saying, we all wake up knowing less than we did the day before. Yes. And, and of course, it, it was really interesting because with an educational establishment, they all threw the toys out the pram. So you can't say that sort of thing. And, and yeah. what it was meaning was the amount of knowledge out there is it, it growing so quickly that our small, tiny p- part of it is actually reducing, not increasing. So we have to keep trying to learn. Um, otherwise, it's going to go, it's going to disappear into nothing. I, I like one of the concepts that I uh, uh, was given was the idea of reverse mentoring. So for, when I was teaching at the university in the early stages, I did that for three years. And um, and I'd like be throwing out examples and they were like, I have no idea what a Betamax video is or something like that. And they would be like telling me it was like when Beats headphones were coming in and Stormzy. And I was like, what's that like and they read and so like you know they were like so I love like working with the younger people yep. because just because we're uh, older doesn't mean you, you well one you can get stuck in your way of thinking as well so I think being open to ideas from younger people getting them to mentor us yep. is 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 great as well so yeah I I once heard a, a, a guy speak. He was a tech. He was a tech entrepreneur, not, not particularly famous one. But it was it was in um, near Bradford somewhere. But he said he asked people in the audience, "What you know? What's the what do you think the best age to be a, a CEO is?" And, a, and a, you know, you're getting anything from you know twenty five to to fifty five or whatever. And he said, "Well, I think it's nine years old." <laughs> and he and he said, "You know, you, you and, and other than the learning, he said you, you're always asking questions." Yeah, uh, you never take no for an answer, and your dreams are still as massive as they could possibly be. Uh, and yeah. I think you know, at least taking part of that is is absolutely valuable. It was fascinating. Um, brilliant. Yeah, that. yeah, I really, I stuck with me that one. I, I quite, quite, <laughs> and, and uh, obviously you, you've you've worked with lots of different people, and you 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 learn a lot. Is there any favourite quotes or sayings that you find yourself using a lot or falling back on in difficult or tough times? Um, it's there's there's one like there's various variations of this, but I think you know a reality check for me when things are getting difficult. Or you know we're all perfectionists. We want to do a great job for our clients, a great job for our team, but we'll kind of say we're not saving lives. Like you know we're doing marketing for tech companies. It's important, but ultimately we're not saving lives. And I think it's just that grounding into going. Let's have a breath. Let's take stand back. What do we need to do here? Um, and it's um, yeah, so that's one that we've used used quite a bit. Just to just to, it's a bit of a like I say, it's a grounding and a bit of a reset. Brilliant, yeah, love it. And yes, because you know it's easy to take things too seriously, isn't it? It's, it's like you know an awful lot of things. I I learned the word awfulization years ago from this lovely American lady. I just I know if it's a real word. I just love the word awfulization. Awfulization. Oh, I'm <laughs> going to take that. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> no, no, you're welcome. I love it because it's like you always just awfulize this, don't we? Well, yeah, we do because it because yeah, it, it's 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 you know it's important what we do, but it's not important and urgent. We're not the as you said, we're not saving lives. Exactly. Exactly. And, and Helen, I'm keen to know what you've learned about yourself um, throughout your career. Yeah, I think that um, over over my career or whilst I've been running the business. Um, well, both. I, I suppose more relevant to the last ten years, but um, mm. but but I guess I guess the last ten years is shaped by the previous, you know, years as well. So I kind of see it as two kind of different sides. I think right. that I think in my corporate time being like a girl who grew up in Barnsley going down to the big smoke down you know yep. and then uh, I hope it's Ellen from Barnsley it was <laughs> like I um I think I spent a lot of time trying to be what I thought I needed to be if that makes sense so yep. it was like you know you have to behave in a certain way you have to speak in a certain way you have to all of these sorts of things and I think I've spent the last 10 years unlearning a lot of that right uh, is about yeah. being authentic about um yeah. knowing regardless of my accent you know it doesn't mean whether you're capable or not of doing your job it's you know yeah. and i think that um being honest like when you think something's not working saying it so i think that yeah being uh, being authentic has been a massive thing for me over the last 10 years yeah I think I've realised I'm probably a bit tougher than I realised I was. <laughs> I was yeah. like, I thought I was a bit, you know, a bit softer than that, but actually <laughs> I'm probably, the, some of the stuff I've had to deal with, I've had to, you know, you you kind of have to grow a pair. 
and deal with yep. it. And um, so I feel that I've, I've um, yeah, yeah. So I think there's been, there's, I think when you're in your own business, there's a lot of self discovery, probably more so than if you're in a corporate, because you don't have to kind of look at yourself quite so hard as you do when you're running a business. There's, there, yeah, there's nowhere to hide, really, is there, when, when you're running your own. It's funny what you said earlier, actually, about the, fir- the, the first person you work with. I, I, I um, One thing I often say to people about about running a business is that, you know, ultimately the book stops with us. You know, it, it, it's, mm. it's, it's that that's the downside of running a business until we have somebody else that, that will take that responsibility from us. But the great thing is we get to choose how it how it how it is. It, it's, yeah. Every business can be run the way we want it to. And that's, so yeah. think, you know, that whole authenticity is so is so key. Let's just be our be ourselves and I think the more we are ourselves the more people get the cho- the proper choice whether or not that's right for them whether we're, we're right for them if we pretend to be someone else they might be selecting somebody on based on a on, on a mis- yeah. misunderstanding um, well, my, my business partner she's from South London and so she's got an equally she has got a strong accent and she's very authentic and I think brilliant. that's been one of the things that she's really modeled for me is being authentic so that's been yeah. great to kind of see that in her and 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 feel okay that's all right then to kind of show up as, as yourself yes. um the other thing I was going to say I was just thinking the other thing is in that in the last 10 years since I've run the business I'm a much better marketeer and I think it's really? because rather than working in one business, like when I was in BT, I knew BT really well. Yes. Actually, now I get the privilege of working, I always say it's 60, but it's going to be so many more than that now. But the privilege of working across all these amazing yep. businesses with these amazing people and you learn so much and yep. you can't help but get better at what you do. So really? I think it's, you. no one ever tells you that, but then you suddenly go in, well, I'm actually quite knowledgeable now. And like I've, I've experienced a lot more than what I would have done. So Brilliant. Oh, great! Absolutely great. What well, a great point. And 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 looking forward, Helen, what does the future look like for you guys? And what, what what challenges do you think you might face, if any? I think it's. I think for me, it's about like how you know you get a business to a certain size. It's like how do you empower your team? How do you bring yeah. on that next generation and empower yes. them to do it? And then I think for me, um, it's also for me personally, it's about it's that kind of shift to giving back a bit more. Yep. So like, yeah, you know, it's been very much about kind of growing the business and growing the right kind of business and being commercially successful. But actually, how do you empower the team? How do you develop others? And then how do you, I think more so now than any other time is I think it's important for businesses and and for business owners to be giving back as well. Yep. Um, so like I did some work um, with the university. I'm on a chair of the advisory board of the business school. But I also like ran some sessions for Kirkley's Climate Commission, looking to do some volunteer stuff there. So I think it's like trying to be able to use the skills that I've got to, you mm. know, have a bit more of a positive impact. Oh, that's brilliant! And it, it it's so useful to use the skills, isn't it? I I, um, I, I used to work. For, it's probably going back ten years ago now, but it was um it was a um a social enterprise, not for social enterprise. It was it was designed to to connect charities with people that could provide the skills they needed mm-hmm. um, because historically you know uh, and it was quite funny I remember being told, told a story about it but you know you'd get a group, group of solicitors they go and paint paint walls or or clear waste ground when you know they're, they're 300 pound an hour type people why why they, they, let's do let's find yeah. some legal work for them to do and, yeah. and we connected people at that level and and, and I remember talking to a local social local local charity about it and and I remember the um the CEO there saying yeah I know he said look we you know we we just had a group of accountants come in to redecorate one of our rooms and, and not only no not only did um not only did they do a bad job we actually had to go and replace the carpet we had to <laughs> not do the walls we had to do the carpet as well and and you know everyone was doing the right thing but it's like much they'd be much better if they did some financial work for that charity exactly <laughs> So exactly. yeah, it, 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 that's, I mean, using our skills just makes sense, doesn't it? In a, in that way. Yeah, I'd be terrible at doing the painting as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm not good at that at all. Either. Um, and and it, it's interesting, especially having that sort of that corporate experience, and then going into into mm. a business. What what advice would you have to anyone that was thinking of going into business right now, Helen? 
Mm, I well, I mean, the, the market it's a tough market at the moment, isn't it? So yep. it's not. But saying that, you know, when I left BT, it was a tough market, and but my pro- proposition was kind of like recession proof because I knew there was these funding available to do the marketing and stuff. But I, so I think, I think, um, do it <laughs> would yep. be. I think accept it's going to be tough, but yep. um, but there will be a lot of freedom and upside. So definitely, yeah. you know, but I think going in with rose tinted glasses is probably not a, you know, sensible thing to do. Surround yourself with great advisors and mentors and coaches and people because, you know, it, I, I really benefited. And even now I benefit from it. You know, my little team that's around me changes and evolves all the time. Yeah. But I, and I know I don't have to be an expert in legal. I don't need to be an expert in tax. I don't need to be... I've got all these people who are those experts who can help me. And there's loads of people for small businesses where you can just get a little slice of their time yep. um, to help you. So I think, you know, that that's the key, isn't it? The other one as well is that, um, isn't it Steve Jobs said that he always employed, I'm sure it's Steve Jobs who said he employed people who were better than him. So he was always looking. And I think that's the same principle is that get people who are better than you Absolutely. around you. It, it it it's really interesting. I think for 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 people at different stages of of growth and, and leadership, mm-hmm. is that ultimately our job is to lead a brilliant team. That's our ultimate yes. goal as being, yeah. and and therefore you'd want that team to be as best it, as it could. And and statistical statistically, it's bound to be better than us. It, yes. And and if we're trying to select people that aren't, then we're not really being an effective leader. Um, yeah. 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 But, yeah. But it's difficult because, uh, you know, e- e- ego has a place to pay in, in most of our lives. So, um, you know, but but it's the most sensible thing to do. But it's tough. Yeah, it, 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 it's quite tough. But but yeah, becoming a great leader and then re- recruiting great people and helping them to become great leaders, I think, is is that structure for, for really effective growth. Yeah, you're right, though. I think it's that kind of like you, you know, as a leader, you think you always have to be right or you always have to know the answers or you need to, you know, and it's knowing that, no, you don't need to do that. And actually, it's about empowering other people and learning from them as well and not being threatened by somebody being better at something than than what what you are as well. So absolutely. And, you know, it's be, it's really be, for me, it's becoming a coach to great people. That's yeah. that's sort of a key thing for, for um yeah. And it, and it's just learning how to develop, but but the challenge, I mean, the challenge is, is that that isn't necessarily the skills we've developed to get to here have mm. been the right skills to develop to get to here, but they're not necessarily the right skills to get to the next level. If that makes sense, it is. I think one of the biggest challenges um, with any business where you tend to be a founder, you tend to be really good at what it is that the business does and you've sold. Yes. So. <clears throat> you know, I'm great at doing partner marketing. And then it's going, how do you get other people to be to greater? And you see a lot of it with founder-owned businesses where they find it really hard to kind of empower and extract themselves because they're still doing the do. Yep. And it's like, how do you get out of doing that? And I, and it's not an easy thing. And, you know, you when you look across other businesses, you see other people kind of grappling with it. I think, I think with us doing the community, we've actually just written a book on partner marketing with all the training. So I think we're doing things to help that. Um, but the temptation is always to like roll up your sleeves and get stuck in because that's your comfort zone, isn't it? That's where you Absolutely. enjoy being and it's like resisting doing that. Absolutely. But, but you're absolutely right. But it is that point of, and, and it, it, it's actually that point of, um, you know, I always describe, you know, if a business grows exponentially, most businesses do, if you increase by the same percentage every year, that's exponential growth. The knee point is often around the ability of the key people to start to delegate effectively. Yeah, yeah. If we don't, then we actually become the barrier to growth because we yeah. are, and, and it's, it, but it's such a difficult thing because the, the, the very thing that's got us to there, which is, working bloody hard and being bloody good at what we do yeah. no longer what we need to do to the next level um, yeah. to find other people and it's such a tough thing um, yeah. to do because it's a mindset change and it's uh, the, uh, one of, one of um, my, my mentors a guy I've trained with few, uh, several times now a guy called Marshall Goldsmith who's known to be the top executive coach of the world so he he coaches the President, he's coached the president of four motor company, Pfizer, Fast Sample, wow. Pharmaceuticals, the World Bank. He 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 he's 
um, wrote a number of books, but one was was the sort of title gets it, but there's a lot behind it. But what got us here won't get us there. Yes, and that's and, and it, it just as a simple concept, it's a really interesting one to be constantly reviewing. It's not, you know, it's not just doing more of what we've done because that yeah. will be a barrier, especially if it's about us. But it's it is it is quite a difficult thing to to change over time. And it com- comfort it can take comfort in the fact that everybody faces the same challenge. Yes, hundred <laughs> percent. It's not you know it's 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 not like it's yeah it, it's it's most people have to go that way. But unfortunately, and this is to some extent. You know, we talk about longevity. Um, is that once we become the limiting factor, um, unfortunately, businesses are like trees; they're either growing or dying. And what happens is often they don't stay the same. We're not just limited; we start to fade. And I think yeah. where a lot of business failure isn't necessarily catastrophic. It it, it is often just over time that we start yes. to recede and recede. And because we're receding, we lose we lose enthusiasm, we lose momentum, and that's often where that problem comes from it's not just you know the, the the sudden change that can affect businesses but it's often just um you know m- my belief is a business growth is directly related to the enthusiasm and energy of its leaders yes so if we start to lose that then that's where the business will will follow unfortunately yeah and i saw somebody speak at the at the university and he was saying that most businesses die unless they reinvent. So there was this curve of like business growth, and then there's they die. Yeah. And there's loads of evidence of it unless, like, someone like Marks and Spencer's allowed to keep being reborn. Yes, in effect. And I think that's so. That's kind of similar to what you're saying, isn't it? It's that Jacob. Yeah, they, they, they the sort of the Jacob where we you typically have that little dip before you grow. And yeah, then, and then you get to a point where you start to plateau off. And if you don't do the same again, then you typically do this. And it's, yeah. it's a very common thing. It's that, as you said, reinvention of, of both the people, the, of, often the products and services too. Mm. Um, so it's, it's yeah. So we have to constantly be reinventing ourselves and our businesses, but that's, yeah. that's, 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 that's part of the fun. So uh, just looking back for yourself, if you, if you were to, if, if you look back over your business and start, if you started again, is there anything significant that you might do differently? Do you think, Helen? You know, I don't think so. I don't think so because I think even the mistakes I've made, which there's been plenty, um, <clears throat> I think that I've learned from them. So, um, and I feel very privileged and honoured for the business that we've had, the growth we've had, the experience that I've got to have. Brilliant. So, um, you know, my business has evolved as my life has evolved, as my kids yep. were growing up and leaving home and, you know, all of these so I think that, um, and there's been different people have come in and out of the business and they've all played a great role there. So no, I do, I, I, I obviously there's a lot of learning, yep. but I won't change it because otherwise I wouldn't have had that learning. No, I, I yeah, I, I, I feel the same. It's an interesting question because it's, and we also wouldn't be where we are. That's the, no. time, you know, that whole sliding door effect If change one thing and might, you might, we might change everything. But it, yeah. it, it, it's interesting. Our founder, Brad Sugars, is a very, very successful guy. He he told me something a long time ago, and he he said um, that he was a, he believed he was as successful as he is because he'd made more mistakes than anybody else he knew. Not yeah. despite it, but it was that willingness to try, you know, yeah. follow our gut and, and but take action that yeah. I think stands people you know, successful businesses and business people. Um, f- from others is that it's the willingness to know that we have to we have to make a decision and we have to move forward uh, yes. because it's procrastination and inaction that typically is is the end of a business rather than the the growth of a business in general yeah no spot on completely agree with that it's um brilliant and 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 finally Helen, what well, can you what would be the best advice you could give an 18 year old you if you're able to go back in time and do so um, I think um, I think be a bit kinder to yourself <laughs> rather than berating yourself and being, yep. happy. you know, there's probably a bit of that that's driven me. <clears throat> but um, but then there's a point where it gets counterproductive, isn't it? Yes. So I think, you know, uh, be a bit nicer to myself. And I think it comes back to what we were saying earlier is I think that gut instinct. I think there was a couple of times through my career where my gut instinct was probably telling me, to do something different and I yep. ignored it and I think um so that would be the other thing that I would say is just you know don't overthink it kind of tune into what 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 feels right yep. um um 
But no, I, you know, I feel really, I feel very privileged for the career I've had. I feel very grateful to the University of Huddersfield for landing me in the IT industry at a prime time. That was, you know, I'd like to say I thought that through, but I wasn't. I was just very lucky. And right. I think that, um, you know, the companies I worked for created a network and knowledge that which I wouldn't, like you were saying before, I wouldn't have been able to do the business I've had. Really grateful for my business partner and the team for, for where we've got to. So, um yeah, it's um yeah, I feel it's been it's been a really good journey. Um brilliant. Well Ellen, thank you so much for your for your, for your time today. And um for anyone okay. watching um that would might like to get in touch with you or your companies, what would be the best way to do so? Yeah, just look me up on LinkedIn. That's the best way to do it, and then we can connect. So it's um Helen Curtis and it's coterie marketing. So that's nobody can ever we get coterie, coterie, all sorts. But it's C O T E R I E marketing, and I'm in Huddersfield as well. So if you if there's multiple Helen Curtis's come up, that's that's who I am. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, it'd be great to to swing by another six twelve months and just see how things have yeah. developed further further with you. And uh, uh, again, thank you so much for your for your time today. Thank you. I've enjoyed it, Chris. Thank you. Me too. Thanks. Bye.